Do you know who Nijinsky was? No. Okay. Well, he was a great ballet dancer, a Russian ballet dancer, lived, I think died about a hundred years ago now. Mm -hmm. He was like the Nureyev and Bereshnikov of his day. He was one of these luminous dancers who could perform the impossible. And he was once asked, how does he do these incredible leaps on stage? And he says, I don't do them, he says. When the is there, they cannot happen. We are manifestations of the universe. And the universe is a created and creative entity. And that creativity pours through us. And if we're open to it. And so, literally, I don't always know where my words are going to come from, but they just come. They come through me, you know? But I know that I'm speaking from some place that's beyond me. I'm not being mystical here. I'm saying this is true for all creativity, you know? So the question is, do we open ourselves up? Do we do the work to clear ourselves so that this stuff can come through us? Welcome to another installment of Behind Greatness by Inspire. It's Luciano here as your host. Uh, before we get into it, uh, as usual, I want to remind the listener, please rate us, subscribe, share with your family and friends, all the good stuff. Uh, this is how we're growing. This is how we have grown the last uh, two and a half years. We've had some really exciting conversations, not some, a lot of exciting conversations, a lot of learning and uh, unlearning that we've been um, that we've been doing on the podcast. Also, last reminder, as our regular listener knows, we are a, a registered charity. If you're so inclined to make a donation to help us with the operations of the podcast, by all means, behindgreatness.org. So today we're um, uh, we're joined by a special guest from Vancouver. He is a renowned speaker, a best-selling author. His name is Dr. Gabor Mate. Uh, he is a highly sought after, excuse me, he is highly sought after for his expertise on a range of topics, including addiction, stress, and childhood development. He spent 20 years in family practice and in palliative care experience. Uh, Dr. Mate worked uh, for over a decade in Vancouver's downtown east side with patients challenged by drug addiction and mental illness. He is also the best selling author of four books published in over 30 languages, and as mentioned, internationally renowned speaker. His book on addiction received the Hubert Evans Prize for Literary Nonfiction. His latest book is called The Myth of Normal Trauma, Illness, and Healing in a Toxic Culture. He is also a co-developer of a therapeutic approach, Compassionate Inquiry, now studied by hundreds of therapists, physicians, counselors, and others around the world. Gabor, thank you for joining us. Pleasure. Thank you for having me, Luciano. I would be remiss if I did not thank uh, Dr. Jeffrey Rediger, who made uh, the initial uh, introduction. So uh, thanks to him. He's just paying me back because I quoted him in my book. Ah, oh, wonderful. oh, yeah, that's right. You did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, he's a, a lovely gentleman. Um, I see it. Yeah, and he said the same of you. Um, what, <laughs> what I want to ask is, is it, it, I went, this first question, is it fitting that on uh, Valentine's Day, the day of this recording, we're talking about, or we're going to talk about trauma? Well, Valentine's Day is all about love and trauma is all about the loss of it. So I couldn't think of a better uh, conjunction than that. Well, beautifully put, because I actually had one question that uh, I thought it would ask towards the end, but <laughs> let's, let's ask it now. Um, before asking you the definition of trauma, purposely yeah. um yeah. can can you love can you love deeply and i say deeply we had another psychiatrist thomas verney and one of his thing is to I be great him, i quote him to in my book but carry on oh i didn't notice that oh wonderful um yeah. I, another wonderful gentleman um uh, a great soul and he said uh, to be great you just need to love deeply can here's a question to you can you love deeply holding trauma you love deeply but you can't love completely um 
you can deeply love another actually uh holding trauma but you can't love yourself holding trauma so the love is not going to be complete um you're not going to completely love love the universe because you're not going to trust the universe so you can have deep loves but not complete ones as long as you're holding trauma so let me ask you then the the second the follow-up question which should have been the precursor anyway you yeah. mentioned big t or large t trauma and small t trauma that word is uh has been bandied about as you know a lot over the last few years uh, it seems like everything uh, can be or is a trauma for those of us who are not engaged in the conversations that you have been. What is the definition of of the two, if you don't mind? Uh, we'll get started that way. Well, let me tell you what trauma isn't. Uh, first of all, trauma is not pain. It's not sorrow. It's not disappointment. It's not grief. It's not stress. All trauma is stressful and involves pain. But not all pain and stress involves trauma. And so people sometimes confuse the two, you know, so to be trivial about it. It was, I went on a picnic last Sunday and it rained. It was traumatic. No, it wasn't. It just rained. And you were disappointed. You know, you were frustrated. But you weren't traumatized. So on the one hand, the word is used a bit too loosely. On the other hand, where it really matters, which is when it comes to health, medicine, mental illness, the law, addiction, child development, it's hardly used at all. So even though all of the conditions I just mentioned involve a lot of trauma, the average physician, educator, parent, policymaker, psychiatrist doesn't even hear about trauma, let alone do they understand it. So and yet trauma is, I think, is a huge dynamic in our culture. So on the one hand, we use the word too promiscuously. On the other hand, we don't use it where it's needed. So what then is trauma? Trauma means, literally means a wound. That's the Greek meaning of the word. And in this case, we're talking about a psychological, emotional wound that lasts until it's healed. And it keeps showing up and its impacts manifest themselves in physical and mental health conditions in most chronic diseases, in all mental health diagnoses, in addictions, in dysfunctional behaviors, in relationship problems, in self-concept, particularly grandiosity on the one hand, or self-criticism on the other. So um, it's just present in so many aspects of our lives, and yet it's not sufficiently understood or talked about where it really matters. Yeah, you have you have mentioned many times, uh, and even in your book, uh, that there is a strange gap between medicine, uh, medicine, the practice of medicine, and the science regarding trauma and stress. Well, let me mention a few examples. Um, so, in Canada, <clears throat> an indigenous woman. Let me mention two facts. Mm -hmm. Amongst women in jail in Canada. 50% of the incarcerated female population is indigenous. They make up 6% of the pop female population. It's huge. 50% of the jail population. It's huge. If you're an indigenous woman, your rate of rheum your risk of rheumatoid arthritis is six times greater than that of others. Six times. This is despite the fact that prior to colonization, there was no rheumatoid arthritis in the indigenous population. Um, if you're a woman with severe post-traumatic stress disorder, your risk of ovarian cancer doubles. Um, a British psychologist said that Richard uh, Bentall, member of the British Academy, has said very accurately that the link between childhood trauma and adult mental health conditions is has been as well established scientifically as the link between smoking and lung cancer. So, so on the one hand, the science is very clear. On the other hand, the average physician doesn't hear a single lecture on trauma in all their training, not a single lecture, not in any medical school anywhere in North America or anywhere in Canada, to be specific. 
This is despite the fact that trauma plays a significant role in all mental health conditions, in addictions. The average addiction physician never hears a lecture on trauma, despite the documented relationship between trauma and addiction. The average physician doesn't hear a single lecture on trauma, despite the documented connection between childhood trauma, rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, um, and a malignancy, and a whole rate of other conditions. So where it really matters, as I said earlier, it's not talked about. Where it doesn't matter, it is talked about. Why? Why is that? Why is that they, they don't hear a single lecture on trauma? Well, Western medicine in general um, separates the mind from the body. <clears throat> so that when you go see a physician, um, they'll look at the physical symptoms. You know, and I was trained as a physician. I know what I'm talking about. Um, we were trained to look at the physical symptoms and the physical findings, including the ones identifiable on various tests. We're never asked to link those symptoms and those conditions to a person's emotional life. It's like the two are separate. Hmm. So if you go to a doctor with psoriasis, the link between psoriasis and childhood trauma is really clear. But nobody's going to ask you about trauma. Nobody's going to ask you about how you feel about yourself, about how you stress yourself. Same with rheumatoid arthritis. The link between rheumatoid arthritis and childhood trauma is scientifically really well established. Not only the coincidence of the two, but also the scientific or the physiological pathways by which emotional stress affects your immune system so as to trigger rheumatoid arthritis. Yeah, we don't hear about that mind-body link. So that's the first point. The second point is a lot of doctors themselves are traumatized hmm. um, um, before they go into medical school. If they weren't before they went to medical school, they're going to be sorely challenged when they do go to medical school. But nobody talks about that either. And Jeffrey Rediger, who we mentioned, yeah, obviously, yeah, Bucks, yeah. Uh, he he had a, a master's in divinity before he went to med school, and he said that yeah. the the difference in philosophy of teaching was different. One was open ended, asking questions, not yeah. not necessarily waiting for an answer, but waiting for another set of questions. Uh, yeah. Whereas uh, med school, it was about learning problem sets. Um, did, did Jeff Ediger also tell you about his personal experience yes. of, being, of being a medical resident and having a child end up in um, infant in uh, intensive care? No, no, no. And he, no. he wasn't given a day off to visit his child? I did not know that. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm telling you, it's a traumatic situation. And uh, later on, they apologized, and I think they even settled with him somehow. In my book, I quote, uh, actually, a, a joint friend of Jeff's and I, uh, a former obstetrician gynecologist called Lisa Rankin, who's now a healer. When she, when Lisa was trained as a obstetrician, one night on her watch when she was a resident, four babies died. She was crying about it in the doctor's room. She was told to get the hell out of there and get back to work. Oh, oh, that. That's the irony. Um, that w is, so it it shocks me to hear this, yeah. um, but it does not surprise. Unfortunately, it doesn't surprise me because I, I see that the business of uh, the uh, professional healthcare, yeah. um, and I and I see how doctors are being uh, uh, um, what is it passed through the meat grinder, um, yeah. having needing this stiff upper lip, so to speak, uh, in the job. Yeah, but that that is. That's also, it's, I think it's a case study. Uh, it's also a case study on loneliness because you talked about loneliness as well as being the outcome of many of the problems that we, that we see today in our modern society, in Western society, like a lack of connection. Well, there's been an epidemic of loneliness that's been growing in the last 40 years, Significant, right. significantly so to the point where Britain has had to establish a minister for loneliness and doc, uh, Dr. Vivek Murthy, who was Vice Admiral Vivek Murthy, who is the American Surgeon General, has written a book on loneliness and is about to publish an official report on the impact of loneliness. Now, loneliness is as much of a risk factor for disease as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. 
and 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 that's because um for early death and disease and lowered immunity and so on that's because as human beings we are what has been called biopsychosocial creatures which means that our biology is inseparable from our psychology which in turn is inseparable from our social interactions and uh, those people that are isolated and lonely as people increasingly are in this competitive individualistic consumer capitalist culture more people are getting sick as a result of that loneliness so loneliness is both a, 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 an effect of a certain culture but it's also the cause of further suffering i grew up in toronto uh, immigrant family uh, italian yeah. background yeah. and um Italians, and not just, but it was in my experience, but Italians were uh, at that time mocked because of how many cousins they have and mm -hmm. how many family members are in their life. So uh, the people that were not Italian around us in the, in the community would, uh, would point out that it was weird that we had so many cousins, that it was weird that we had so many family functions, that uh, yeah. you've got to be your own man. You're like, I'm talking about as an eight, nine, 10 year old. Um, I miss those days when I had so many people around um, and I could, I, I remember having a sense uh, as uh, like my friends, a sense of confidence. Well, if you talk to indigenous people, that's how they used to grow up. So they talk to their, their grandmothers, their cousins, their uncles, you know, like I have an indigenous friend and, you know, like 80 cousins, you know, and I have, I have, two cousins with whom I'm barely in contact, you know, and um, generally um, Roma people um, from uh, Italian, Portuguese, Spanish, all the Romance languages, Southern, they tend to have these relationships. Indigenous people tend to have these relationships and they prom these relationships promote health is what mm. they do, you know, and actually what happens is as people get, um, for example, multiple sclerosis used to be much more common in the northern latitudes. So they thought it was weather. But now it's actually happening more in the southern latitudes as well. Why? Because people are getting more lonely, more isolated. So these links are real. Well, that, that's interesting. Uh, it, uh, a quick small case study I had a second cousin of mine who's 15 years older than me. And she yeah. passed away about 10 years ago from MS. And she I was the only cousin that I knew that grew up as the only child and yeah. and they live further away from the, like the the rest of the relatives so she didn't have that interaction I wonder if that was uh, if that was well, an I, I, I'll tell you something else about her mm -hmm. she was a people pleaser she had trouble saying no she <laughs> had uh, difficulty being angry in a healthy way she tended to believe that she was responsible for other people feel and she put other people's needs ahead of her own 100% and I've never met anybody with a mess who doesn't have those personality traits. And I'm not blaming the individual, but these are the results of what happened to them in childhood. And so again, it's an example of the mind-body unity, which is in, in actual fact, in actual life, inextricable. And yet, and we also know, like if somebody comes to me with MS, I should as a physician, and I would, if I was still in practice, offer them whatever physiological treatment is necessary. But I would also talk to them about how they live their lives and how they feel about themselves and what stresses they take on and how they take on the stresses of other people and ignore their own health and their own needs. Because if they understood that, they could actually effectively stop the progression of their illness. And Jeff Rediger, whom we talked about, he wrote this book called Cured, which I'm sure he talked to you about, which is about these so-called spontaneous remissions, where people are given a, a death sentence of a diagnosis, and lo and behold, 20 years later, they're still alive. And Jeff researched, what is it that these people did? And these remissions, it turns out, are not spontaneous at all. They have to do with people taking agency and really looking after them. And the biggest change that people seem to undergo is a different relationship to themselves. And so I found the same thing. I talk about it in the myth of normal. I've, I, I've talked to people with MS who no longer have symptoms without any medications. 
you know and so this is not miracle this is not voodoo and it's not uh, accident it's because the mind and the body cannot be separated and 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 your psychology is everything to do with your physiology it's not your fault you didn't ask to have your psychology develop in a certain way that happened in an environment that you didn't choose that you were born into but it has impacts and again medical practice despite all the science never looks at that good point let's take that uh because jeffrey uh, not to mention him again but he's been such an influence with some of the uh, thinking in the last few months yeah. um he met a jill bolt taylor i'm not sure if you've heard of jill bolt taylor i've talked with her yeah jeff introduced us the woman okay. with the stroke my, yes. my, stroke, my yeah. stroke of insight yeah well she's also been on this podcast and she introduced us to jeff but okay. she she said that she um she immediately respected Jeff because the first question he asked her when he first met her yeah. is how did you get better? She says yeah. I I didn't have one doctor in fifteen years or whatever it was twelve years ever ask me how I got better. Not only that, I have found and Jeff has found and other researchers have found that when patients do get better, the doctors never ask yeah. how, how did you do it. I've known people who've overcome terminal malignancy and the doctors, the best the doctors will say is whatever you're doing, keep doing it. But they never ask, how did you do it? You know, which is in astonishing almost, isn't it? That triggered a, a wonderful memory that I've never shared. Um, yeah. Bear with me. Quick example. Yeah. My mom was diagnosed with cancer given two years. We didn't know this uh, when she was 49 years old. I was in my early 20s. Wow. Uh, we didn't know that she was given two years. She she fought like an SOB. Um, mm. uh, she insisted on staying alive 18 years. She stayed alive 18 years to see her kids marry nine yeah. grandkids. Yeah. Um, a wonderful testament. Uh, in her last few months where she was, uh, she was told that she wouldn't be able to get out of it at this point, she went palliative. Right before she moved, she moved over to the palliative care, one of her primary doctors who's a specialist oncologist in Toronto um, had her in a couple of case studies as well. And they named a case study after her afterwards. Uh, he whispered in her ear. I was there in the room. It was me and my dad whispered in her ear. Uh, he said, I love you. I've always said that the cases we should investigate are not only our successes, or our failures, but also those successes that happen without us as physicians. We should investigate those cases. And Jeff has. So does a woman called Kelly Turner. Kelly is a oncological psychologist. And she's written a book called Radical Remission. And again, it's about the same thing. And her experience is also, these people get better without medical treatment or despite the failure of medical treatment and the doctors never ask them how did you do it you've had uh, you've had a long journey in your life and you you've been pretty public about it uh and you've written about it and you continue yeah. to write about it yeah. uh, and it seems uh i shouldn't say it seems uh it's a journey of uh darkness to light a continuous journey of darkness to light if you don't mind for the listener uh a, a quick a quick background in, in the conditions, environment you were born in and grew up in before you came to Canada. I, I think it's important for the listener to, to understand where you came from. Well, sure. But first of all, there's actually no, just think about it. There's no such thing as darkness. There's no dark waves. There's light waves, but there are no dark waves. So darkness is simply the absence of light, you know? Hmm. And St. Paul said, that once you shine a light into the darkness, the darkness becomes light, which is obvious, you know? So what then is darkness? Darkness is simply what we don't see and what we don't know. And uh, my wife, Ray, of my wife of 53 years now, she actually said when she first met me, she could see my darkness, she could see my light, and she made it her job to <laughs> shine a light into the darkness. Now it's a... No, nobody should take that on for anybody else. That's typical gendered behavior in this culture, you know. Mm. But and it, it cost her a lot over the years to. What did it cost her? 
Well, it caused her depression and it caused her uh, stress. It caused her the um, putting our children's needs secondary to the relationship. Um, these are the price that women pay in this culture. And it's not surprising that women have 80% of autoimmune disease exactly for that reason. 80%? Yeah, yeah. 70, 80% yeah. of autoimmune disease happens wow. to women. And wow. it's not a biological thing. Like with the indigenous women in Canada, they never used to have autoimmune disease. It's a product of stress. And that stress is a product of culture. Now, in terms of my own history, um, well, I mean, I don't know if I need to tell you much. I was a Jewish infant born in Budapest two months before the Nazis occupied the country. And I spent the first year of my life as a Jewish infant with a mother under Nazi occupation under the threat of death and starvation and so on and, and uh, stressful one might say you know <laughs> and, uh, and uh, as an infant one absorbs one's parents stresses and um, you can't help it and so you know after the death of her parents in Auschwitz the abduction into forced labor of my father we didn't he she didn't know if he was dead or alive for at least half a year or more and not to mention the bombing of Budapest by the Allies and the poor conditions in the country, and then this vicious right wing dictatorship, fascistic, anti Semitic, murderous dictatorship. Uh, separation from me for six weeks to save my life. So you can imagine what I go, you know, what the imprints would have been and, and what the impact would have been. Um, what I come back to though is. What you mentioned earlier, but the big T and the and the small T. Mm. Uh, you don't need to have these big dramatic events for children to be hurt. The big T traumatic events are war, um, uh, emotional, physical, sexual abuse, neglect, the parent dying, parent being jailed. Those are the traumatic events. Um, but trauma meaning a wound. You don't need these traumatic events to uh, wound a child. As a matter of fact, I would say, dramatic as my infancy sounds, and certainly historically was, I wasn't as wounded as a lot of kids in good middle-class homes here in Canada in peacetime. Hmm. Because apart from the, not that I want to compare traumas, but my big traumas happened in the first year of my life due to circumstances that were outside my family, for the most part. Not my parents were perfect, they were not. And certainly emotionally, they never did understand me very well. But other than that, it was quite a functional family. The parents who loved each other and respected each other and loved their kids after the war, once they were reunited. A lot of kids grew up in families where there's a lot of inter-partner stress, relational stress. The father may have an addiction or the mother may have an addiction. There might be unresolved traumas that both partners are carrying. And those goes, that goes on for years and years and years. And th th those are what we call the small T traumas, you know, where it's not big and dramatic and self-evident, but children's needs are not being met and a child can be wounded. So the reason I, when I do talk about my own trauma, just be transparent about my own history but i also don't want to create the impression that you need those big ticket events for children to be hurt children are hurt regularly in this culture you know it's it, maybe it's because i'm a gen x uh i mean i i i had grandparents uh and older uncles and great uncles uh that yeah. fought in a war that they didn't want to as teenagers yeah. and you know they would they would always Actually, they would almost never share their experiences with us because they were, I, I suspect, so traumatic, um, the, the, uh, those experiences for them. Um, but, you know, later on in life, I would hear from that generation often, yeah, yeah. What, do you, what do you know about problems? Like real problems are getting shot in the leg or real problems are starving in a trench for a week, you know, yeah. that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, uh, the smaller T's... Um, the, the smaller teas, I guess, uh, they're much more insidious because they, 
they really don't show up and and unless you pay attention i think yeah, yeah. well a very simple one is um if somebody shows up with a problem like addiction or or, or you know mental health problem or autoimmune disease hmm. i might ask them how's your childhood they said i had a happy childhood and um then I asked them a few questions. And one of the questions I ask is, did you ever feel sad or angry or lonely or upset as a child? They'll say yes. And I say, well, who did you talk to about it? And they said, nobody. Hmm. Well, do you have children? Yeah. If your children felt sad or unhappy or lonely, who would you want to talk to? Oh, I want to talk to me. If they didn't talk to you, how would you understand that? Oh, well, they didn't trust me. They didn't feel safe. I said, there's your happy childhood. But people don't remember what didn't happen. Yes. Because they only had the one life. They yes. can remember if they were hit, maybe. But they won't remember that they weren't listened to. That can be wounding to a child, significantly wounding to a child. Well, so those those kinds of details, not remembering what didn't happen to you, um, yeah. started to come back when I became a young parent or when I became a parent, I, I started to understand a little bit more about what wasn't communicated to me when I was a kid, yeah. when I had one of my own in front of me. Well, that's a, a, a powerful way to get to know yourself is to become a parent. <laughs> that's true. For better, or for worse. Yeah. Well, ideally for the better, because the better you know yourself, the better friend you'll be. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, uh, so on that, uh, still on the subject, uh, you have, I've heard you say this before, that uh, speaking of environment and sensitivity to the environment, uh, for some reason, infant boys uh, in your research and your work, you have found to be more sensitive to their environment and stresses in their environment than, than girls. That's not my research. That's the research of a lot of other people I've simply cited. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because boys are more sensitive. They're more easily hurt, actually. And yet, they're treated more roughly than girls are. It's a really bad combination. You know? As a former boy, I, I would yeah. attest to that. I, I remember wanting... A, so I remember always being envious of other boys who were more rambunctious in class because they were the yeah. more confident ones, it seemed like. Yeah, uh, but they were the ones always to have like the silly ideas, like the people yeah. would laugh at, or yeah. they would they couldn't sit still, and those were the first ones that were targeted by the teacher. That's right, be because they were outside, they were behaving outside of the normal, quote unquote. And those were usually the sensitive kids. I mean, my first book was about ADHD. It's called Scattered Minds, and um, actually, what's astonishing is that that book was published in 1999, 24 years ago, and Two weeks ago, it reappeared on the Canadian national bestseller list in the Global Mail. You know, huh. um, congrats. Well, thanks. I mean, just to boast, I had three books in the top 10 in the last couple of weeks. But that's because I think I'm making some sense to people. But mm -hmm. but that ADHD, the difficulty sitting still or tuning out, is actually a reflection of the environment. When, pe when sensitive, so those boys are very sensitive, very sensitive. And the more sensitive you are, the more troubled you are when things go wrong. And then the more you have to cope with that stress by tuning out. So you develop this so-called disease, which is not a disease at all, called ADHD. And then the teachers will punish you. That was the worst kind of punishment uh, for me in a 30-person yeah. class to be singled out by the teacher for that kind yeah. of reason. So I always avoided that behavior. I've had um, adults sitting in my office in their 30s and 40s shedding tears about something a teacher said to them when they were 12 years old. A stunted life. Well, um, yeah. Um, adults don't realize how much power they actually have to both benefit and nourish, but also to hurt children. In fact, the two powers are completely connected. Quick change of gears here. Yeah. Uh, why did you choose to work in palliative care as a physician? You know, um, my life is sometimes a matter of choices and sometimes just stuff happens and I go for it, you know, and um, 
it's not that I made a decision to do it. I was walking down the hall of the hospital once, and two of my colleagues who were working in the palliative care, they were the heads of the palliative care department, they said, we're leaving our position. Would you like to take over? And I said, sure. You know, I mean, it's not like I thought about it, but it just felt right, you know, and it was right. I did it for seven years. I was the medical coordinator of the palliative care unit at Vancouver Hospital. And it's work that I really loved because confronting death and working with people who are dying is such honest work and it's such holy work, you know. I mean, to support people on their last journeys in this lifetime, it's an honor, you know. And you get to know people very quickly, very deeply. And you get to do good things for them. And you help to... I delivered a lot of babies. So it's, it's almost like these are the two polar ends of human existence. Mm. And dying. And uh, in both cases, there's something new that's taking place. And something very human. So... Um, I love that work. Um, I did it for seven years. Did it change your beliefs about the uh, uh, about the afterlife, so to speak? That experience, seven years. I've never had beliefs about the afterlife, and I don't now. So, I, I mean, I don't, I don't argue with anybody, but nothing in my mind tells me that there's any kind of, a, you know, my mind. For my mind, it just doesn't work to think that way. I think, you know, I, I it's, it's, not, it's not that I reject spirituality, on the contrary, but I just don't need any kind of a concept of afterlife. You've talked about your experience um, with uh, a psychedelic, uh, with a psychedelic, excuse me, with ayahuasca in Costa Rica. Yeah. yeah. Um, I have a lot in Peru, yeah. actually. Although, in Peru. sorry. Although I was in Costa Rica just two weeks ago in an ayahuasca ceremony. It so happened. How did that go? Uh, I've done ASCO many times. Um, I have a very thick skull, you know, you have to understand. And uh, it's hard to penetrate it. And so for me, it was, what can I tell you? It was a good experience, but there wasn't anything. There's no angels or trumpets or and God didn't speak to me from a throne in the sky. Sure. I had no visions, no anacondas or jaguars or leopards. The trees did not speak to me. Um, I just had a sort of silent, introspective night. That's what happened to me. Other people had tremendous experiences in the same space. Why, why do you take it or why have you done it? What are you looking for when, uh, when you go through those celebrations? I'm looking to go deep into myself or deep into reality um, because our ordinary everyday mind, um, as functional as it can be, can also be a barrier to deeper perception. Yeah, you've mentioned on an interview that ayahuasca removes the membrane. In, in general, um, psychedelics remove that membrane between the subconscious and the conscious mind. So you get to witness your subconscious in a certain sense while awake. Like when you're sleeping, you get the subconscious all the time when you're dreaming. Mm -hmm. But then you're not awake for it. In this case, you can be awake to your own unconscious. Well, that's what's fascinating for me too. Do you think that the subconscious is a different reality or is this one that we can't tune into unless we're in a different physical state? Well... Looking at it properly, there are no different realities. There's only one reality, but it's a different level of reality. And it's a level of reality that usually we have no access to. It kind of pulls us like a puppet master pulls a puppet. Very often we're governed by our unconscious impulses that we're barely even aware of, if at all. Um, so it's not a different reality. It's a deeper level of reality that most of the time we have no access to. And uh, especially if there's trauma lurking there, let me tell you, it's going to govern your life until you figure it out. And I don't care if you're king or president, that's what's going to happen. I mean, look at, I recently read the uh, autobiography of Prince Harry. Mm -hmm. you know? And uh, there's a man deeply traumatized. <laughs> and, it, and, and, it, and it doesn't matter 
that he grew up with all this privilege and uh, his royal highness and your you know all this stuff and a queen for a grandmother and a heir to the throne as the father he was he was a human being deeply hurt yeah. you know well and, i mean to a child all of that is meaningless it's all that it's all meaningless yeah yeah you used the word puppet master a few minutes ago uh, you know i've heard you i've heard you say that trauma is the puppet master behind the scenes yeah very often it is yeah uh i remember though also listening to you talk about what the it was a one word answer what the opposite of trauma is it's probably connection i would have said but I, I, what what did i say even better <laughs> even yeah. better what you better said, thing what did i say liberation okay very good it's true yeah yeah and liberation actually means well okay let, let me sort of talk my way out of this one <laughs> you don't have to <laughs> it's good connection with connection with oneself okay and that's what and that's what liberation actually is you know when when the personality that we've constructed to cope with our traumatic imprints loses relaxes its hold on us and we can be truly ourselves that's liberation that's deep connection with ourselves and that's the answer to trauma you said something else that i i listened to in a uh, in an interview not not so long ago that you don't you're not a fan of the language of of um the language that stipulates that somebody has an addiction or has a disease and your yeah. words were it it's a process happening inside of someone it's not separated by the person right so sometimes when i write books as i did this one the myth of normal i write as much for myself as i do for others it's my way of working out mm. understanding things i could sense so, that too yeah. because some of the ideas that i had before i wrote the book i had let go of and other ones had taken their place by the time i finished the book this is one of them so before i wrote the book if somebody said to me, so and so has cancer, or so and so has multiple sclerosis, or so and so has an addiction, or so and so has multiple sclerosis, I would say, Yeah, I understand. I understand what you're talking about. Well, I still understand what they're talking about, but I no longer see that way. Because here's the assumption there's a hidden assumption in our language, has so many hidden assumptions that we don't question. So, um, I know this is audio probably right now, but you can see me on the screen. I have a cup in my hand. I have a cup. This cup is mine. I can give it away, break it, throw it away, use it, not use it. But its quality, its shape and its color and its inner nature has nothing to do with me. I have the cup. It's distinct from me. When I say I have, say, ADHD, which is something I was diagnosed with, that's why I wrote my first book about it. Mm -hmm. When I say I have it, there's an assumption there which is there's this entity called ADHD, this thing that I have, it's separate from me. It's got its own characteristics that are distinct from me. And, and uh, I just happen to have it. Or I have rheumatoid arthritis, which is this thing, which has got a life of its own, just like the cup has an existence of its own, multiple sclerosis has an existence of its own, I just happen to have it. It ain't the way it is. Not when you actually look at it. Multiple sclerosis or ADHD, they're processes. They're processes that happen inside an individual mind, brain, and body. Those processes are determined and influenced by a combination of um, certain sensitivities and life experience. That also means that given that they're manifestations of my life, if I change how I relate to my life and how I relate to myself, those processes can also change so that they have no separate existence of their own. And that's what Jeff Rediger found out. And that's what I found out, is that these things, these so-called things that we call diseases are actually processes that reflect our lives including our unconscious lives, significantly our unconscious lives. But it also means we have some agency. The more we understand how that process arose, 
and more in my life evoked that process or continues to evoke it, the more agency I have, the more liberation I have. What you've just explained now, uh, I've read about you, or for, excuse me, from you, uh, it's rang very, uh, very deeply for me because I, I, I understand for myself that this, this is linked to also your beliefs. Yeah, and especially your unconscious beliefs. Ah, yeah. Well, yeah, okay. So you, you said uh, in your book, you wrote uh, in the last chapter, um, something that was really powerful for me um, about the willingness to be disillusioned. Yeah. And how, how empowering that is. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I often talk to people uh, who, um, who say to me, you know, I got disillusioned. And I say, congratulations. You know, what are you talking about? Well, would you rather be illusioned or disillusioned? Would you rather believe in fairy tales or would you rather know reality? Because an illusion is, is an escape from reality. It's good to be disillusioned in that sense. Even if it hurts, that pain is sacred pain. It'll help you grow. Not a bad thing to be disillusioned. And I mentioned in the book a number of examples in the realm of politics. So I got disillusioned throughout my life, you know. But each time I got disillusioned, I learned something about the real nature of the world. And for, and as to that degree, I became, you know, more liberated. And same thing in our personal lives. It's painful and disappointing to be disillusioned. It's also liberating if you're willing to learn from it. Do you look forward to being disillusioned about uh, current beliefs now? I look forward to, uh, I, I don't, I, naturally, it's, it's in the nature of illusions that you don't know that it's an illusion. You know? <laughs> well said. Well so, said. <laughs> so I don't know what I'm looking forward to, but I'm looking forward to having a deeper understanding and knowledge of truth. And if that means letting go of more illusions, yes. On that. What is, and I know this is a theme for you uh, in the book, I'm not going to say what chapter, um, waking up. What does is, what is waking up mean to you? Well, what does being asleep mean to you? Um, being comfortable with the illusion. Yeah. That's what dreams are. No, actually, dreams contain a lot of truth, if you know it, understand them. Sure. But, that. but on the surface level, they're just stories, you know, that our mind is made up. So waking up is knowing the truth of the dream. We had a guest recently, Diana Pasolka. She's a professor, a professor of religion in uh, North Carolina, wrote okay. a book in uh, 2017 and has like, launched her on the world stage because she she spent six years like Indiana Jones researching things that um the the world didn't appreciate didn't understand uh, that were being studied by US government and military uh, oh, yeah. and she brought them to light oh yeah it's called american cosmaker book um mm -hmm. and we talked about creativity so she likes to talk about creativity she she also lectures on creativity um and we talked about the the uh, characters that she met along the way in her research that uh, one of them is still she cannot name him she calls him mm -hmm. tyler d as a fight club, Tyler Durden, uh, part of the Invisible College. Um, and we were, we were talking about him and about outside agency, how he, uh, he gains information as downloads. Yeah. And I, I asked her about her agency. Is there outside agency when she is in a creative activity? And the reason why I'm bringing this up is because in the writing of your book, you said that you were in Costa Rica at one point writing, you said to her that the words came rushing to you when you're in Costa Rica. What does that mean when it, they come rushing to you? Well, so here's the thing. You're probably too young, but do you know who Nijinsky was? Uh, whom, sorry? Uh, Nijinsky? No. Okay. Well, he was a great ballet dancer, a Russian ballet dancer, lived, I think died about 100 years ago now. Mm -hmm. It was like the Nureyev and Bereshnikov of his day. He was one of these 
luminous dancers who could perform the impossible. And he was once asked, how does he do these incredible leaps on stage? And he says, I don't do them, he says. When the jisk is there, they cannot happen. We are manifestations of the universe. And the universe is a created and creative entity. And that creativity pours through us. And if we're open to it. And so, literally, I don't always know where my words are going to come from. But they just come. They come through me, you know. But I know that I'm speaking from some place that's beyond me. I'm not being mystical here. I'm saying this is true for all creativity, you know. So the question is, do we open ourselves up? Do we do the work to clear ourselves so that this stuff can come through us? And so when I'm working with somebody, um, say in a therapeutic sense, I don't necessarily know what I'm going to do five minutes later. But I trust that if I can stay present enough, the truth will come through me. That'll help them guide them to their own truth. You know, and the same thing with writing. When it's really happening, it's just happening. It's not so much that I'm doing it. It's, 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 it's happening. Now, sometimes I also have to really work at it hard and, to, you know, find the right word and so on. But if that's the level to it, if there was only that laborious um, effort, I would never be a writer. And I would not have written the books that I've written, including this recent one. Seems like you're in a constant state of creation. I wouldn't say constant. Uh, sometimes in a state of misery or despair or or, uh, <laughs> or, greed, or greed or whatever it is, you know. But yeah, I can get into states of creation as well. It's true. What do you think your last thoughts might be before you pass? I haven't got a clue. Oh my God, I left the oven on, uh, I left the oven on, you know, <laughs> I don't know. Um, but, but I have no, I don't give those things thoughts. Um, but I, I, I know what I, I want to be able to think is that I've done what I could and that I was who I was, you know, and, uh, and that my children will know how much they were loved, despite all the pain I may have caused them, you know. Um, and uh, I hope I'll be able to be really grateful, really grateful for the opportunity to be given this existence. Those are the things I hope. What I will actually think. <laughs> oh, you my God, know. I got it all wrong. That's what you're doing. <laughs> I, I don't know. I have no idea. Well, it's uh, very honest of you. Uh, I'll ask you for uh, one more, one last bit of honesty before I let you go. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what is what does greatness mean to you? What does greatness mean to you? I can tell you a story about that. Um, Martin Buber was a Jewish religious spiritual thinker, one of the philosophers of the 20th century. And he collected a group of um, stories called Tales of the Hasidim. And the Hasidim were, still are, you know, Orthodox Jews. And by Tales of the Hasidim, he meant the Hasidic masters, the rabbis and teachers in the Hasidic tradition in Eastern Europe. And one of the stories he tells is Rabbi Tzvi, or whatever his name is, dies and goes to heaven. And he says to his, you know, or he's talking to his followers, and he says, when I go to heaven... When I go to meet my maker, they're not going to ask me, why weren't you the great Moses? Or why weren't you the great Isaiah? They're going to ask you, why weren't you Tzvi? Why weren't you yourself? So greatness is just being oneself, one's authentic to oneself. That's what greatness is. It's not measured by what you achieved out there, what people think of you, even what you think of yourself. It's how true were you to your true self. That's what greatness is. There's a lot of great people in the world who you've never heard of. 
And there's a lot of people in the world that you've heard of who are not great at all. Those are wonderful last words. Gabor. I hope they were my last words, but we'll see. Wow. With us for now. With us <laughs> oh, for now. Oh, good. Thanks, thanks for pointing that out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for your time, Gabor. This has been wonderful. Thank you. Uh, it's a great pleasure to speak with you. Thanks for your very uh, thoughtful and challenging questions. Hey, it's Enrico Colantoni here, actor, director, and dedicated napper. Like what you heard today? There's more to come. Make sure to subscribe to Behind Greatness and learn about our live events at inspirenorth.com. You'll also find links to our social media right on our website, so be sure to give us a like and follow. Until next time, stay inspired. <laughs>